welcome back everyone and um, if you're watching this on Moodle later or if you're watching it on YouTube five years welcome welcome um, and lecture number three part number four um, so we were talking about transposable elements transposable elements are also called jumping genes which I like much more um, discovered by Barbara McClintock yeah 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 that's why I did the intro I, I pressed the record button don't worry uh, they were discovered by Barbara McClintock, who won a Nobel Prize in 1983. And for the students that are watching, I have a very particularly favorite thing about Nobel Prize winners. So generally there is at least a couple of questions about people who won Nobel Prizes on the exam as a tip. So if it says that someone won a Nobel Prize, um, remember their name because I might ask you what they discovered or what was discovered by whom. So transposons are pieces of DNA that jump around in the DNA making copies of themselves or cutting and pasting themselves and by doing so they can disrupt the genes of the host. Um, not only that but um, they are very important in plants where they generate variation since plants cannot move. Um, the, yeah the plant needs to generate variation somehow because it, it cannot just move to a different country and look for a mate there. It has to do it with the mates that are around itself. So a little bit about transposable elements. Transposable elements are uh, coming in two different classes. So you have a class one which is called a retrotransposal um, which is uh, kind of like a retrovirus. So uh, they are generally made of DNA. Um, they recruit the host system and get translated into RNA um, then they are reverse transcriptased into DNA um, and then they integrate. Um, so hey, there is this reverse transcriptase which they use, they generally bring their own reverse transcriptase. Transposons are not pieces of DNA that don't do anything, they can code proteins as well. So if a, a transposal encodes a reverse transcriptase then it is called a class 1 retrotransposal. Um, furthermore, there's also things d uh, that are DNA transposons and they make direct copies of themselves so there is no RNA intermediate involved and uh, they uh, use a protein called transposase uh, so that they can jump around in the genome. Um, besides being able to divide transposons into class 1 and class 2 transposons, um, oh, I first have a picture of them. I added a nice picture. So here we see a retrotransposon, right? So the retrotransposon is transcribed and translated into proteins. Um, then there is the uh, ribonucleoprotein complex being formed, which then um, makes the reverse transcriptase. And then the reverse transcriptase makes the RNA intermediate into DNA, which then integrates into the genome. So the, the one has so one retrotransposon is then has so transformed into RNA the DNA and then the DNA can integrate into several parts of the genome disrupting different genes. If we look at uh, class 2 DNA transposons, a DNA transposon for example the Marrier type, um, yeah goodbye Testosaurus, see you next time. Um, they have this uh, transposase um, which is called TASE in uh, T-A-S-E in uh, the DNA. So what happens is, is that um, it it, a transposase is binding, right? So this thing is transcribed into RNA. The RNA is then, um, um, the, so the, the transposase is transcribed, not the whole uh, transposon. Um, proteins are made, and then two of these proteins, they kind of cut out. So they have these uh, tear areas, which are sequences which are recognized by the transposase um, and they are bound by the protein. The two proteins then bind together making one of these little loops and then the whole thing goes and floats away from the genome and once it hits another part of the genome it just rolls into the genome over there. Um, so the reverse process by first binding and then um, extracting again. But where they integrate is uh, not um, is not known. So there, there's no sequence at which uh, DNA transposons are integrated, although you can recognize them by the tear sequences because the tear sequences again is kind of a, a palindrome, right? So you have a sequence here which is then mirrored on this side. So interesting and a really funny system of how these um, 
DNA transposons jump around. But besides classifying them as class 1 and class 2, um, you can also classify them as autonomous or non-autonomous. So autonomous transposable elements, they can move by themselves. So they, for example, the mari uh, mariner type, right? they have their own transposase. So because they have their own transposase, they don't need anything else. They encode the proteins that they need to move around, um, but you also have um, non-autonomous um, uh, transposable elements, and these require the presence of another transposable element to move around. Um, for example, you can have uh, transposable elements which do not have a reverse transcriptase, but they are class 1, right? So they do have an RNA intermediate which needs to be transcribed into DNA. But since they do not code for reverse transcriptase themselves, they have to recruit the reverse transcriptase either from the host cell or from another transposable element. Um, and of course, for class 2, this means that some class 2 trans uh, transposable elements, they don't have any transposase, they don't encode for transposase themselves, so they, they borrow the transposase of other transposable elements. So, so you can have a class 1 autonomous um, transposable element, or you can have a class 1... Uh, uh, you can have a class 1... You can have a class 1 autonomous or a class 1 non-autonomous. And then, that it's, so in theory, there are four different groups of transposable elements. So a little bit more about regulatory elements, right? Because like we saw, if you have a gene, then every gene has a, a area in front of the gene and a little area in the back of the gene, which regulates the expression of this gene. So a regulatory element is defined as a segment of a DNA molecule, which is capable of increasing or decreasing the expression of specific genes within this organism. So there are two classes of regulatory elements. There are activators and repressors, right? So, so either you, you upregulate a gene or you repress the regulation of a gene. And when we look at regulatory elements, they are generally defined as cis, which means that they are located close to the gene, um, which means that around like minus 200 to like 50 base pairs or 40 base pairs into the gene, um, then they are close by. So close by here means like 200 base pairs from the gene which they regulate. And then we also have things which are transregulatory, and transregulatory means that they are located far away. And far away can even mean on a different chromosome. Um, the cis regulation part is actually split into three distal parts, uh, is, is split into three parts. So the distal part is the part which starts at like minus 200 and then is in front of the gene. You have the proximal part, which is 50 to 200 base pairs in front of the gene. And then you have the core part, and the core part generally overlaps with the 5 prime UTR. So the core part itself starts around 50 base pairs in front of the gene and can end around 40. 40 base pairs into the gene. So, and here you see that visualized. And so the promoter itself is, a, is smaller than a thousand base pairs. And so we have the core promoter region, then the proximal elements which regulate, and then we have the distal regulatory elements which can be further away. Um, but hey, in total, cis means in the neighborhood. So that means that it's it's close. So it, like if you if you're talking about it's a million base pairs away, then this means that there's a trans regulator. So some of the most well-known regulatory elements are, for example, the Tata box, uh, also called the goldberg hochness box. Um, and this is the sequence, so this is how it looks like. So it's T-A-T-A-A-A, -A -A, so that's why it's called the Tata box. Um, and this is, the, this is one of these uh, core regions. So uh, the Tata box is generally located 30 base pairs in front of the gene, um, and uh, proteins bind here to allow transcription of the gene. And again, in bioinformatics, you can use this sequence to learn if something is a gene. Because if you see TA, TAAA in, a, uh, uh, in, in, in the genome of, of, for example, a human, then you can be very, very certain, well, not 100% certain, but almost always there is a gene next to it. Right, so 30 base pairs downstream of the Tata box, there is the start of a gene. So these regulatory elements help us to predict where in the genome 
are certain genes located. Um, and around 24% of human genes have a tata box somewhere in the promoter. So it is a very consistent motif that comes back a lot. Um, and, and it's one of these things that as a bioinformatician you can use the knowledge that a tata box is generally 30 base pairs in front of a gene to predict genes um, so that you know where there is. Of course there's a lot of different regulatory elements. There are things which are called frame shift elements which um, make or which where the polymerase is making um, RNA and then it hits one of these frame shift elements and because it hits the element it gets pushed back and pushed back like one or two base pairs. So what happens is because every amino acid is coded by three um, base pairs, so it allows genes to be over, or it, so it allows one gene to have overlapping codons, right? So a codon which is in the, uh, which starts at zero, and then at a certain point, the thing gets pushed back like a little bit, and then it continues on. Um, there are internal ribosomal entry sites, which means that a gene can start transcribing the protein halfway through so it doesn't start at the beginning of the messenger RNA but somewhere halfway in the messenger RNA there's another site for the ribosomal entry um, and, and it can transcribe. We have things like iron response elements which bind iron so when iron is present in the cell it activates all of the proteins needed to deal with iron located in the cell. Um, things like leader peptides, pyrolysis insert sequence, ribo switches, and RNA thermometers. Uh, we have the selenocysteine insertion element. So these are all different ribos uh, regulatory elements which uh, in bioinformatics are used to predict genes. And if there is a gene, and how does this gene look like, and if this gene is regulated by, for example, temperature, or if it's responding to iron. And so all of these different regulatory elements, they have sequence motifs and these sequence motifs we can recognize using a computer and then we can do a prediction to see if there is a gene located at this position in the genome. All right, a few words about other types of DNA. So for example, we have mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is DNA which is located in the mitochondria. So as you should know as a biologist, if you have a, a cell, then this cell has a nucleus and the nucleus holds the DNA, so the, the information which is inherited from father to, to offspring and from mother to offspring. Um, but the mitochondrial DNA is a little bit different because the mitochondria are um, um, structures in the cell that produce energy and these structures you only get from your mother. So in the, in the egg cell um, there are mitochondria, in the sperm cell there's also mitochondria, but when the sperm cell fuses with the egg, the tail where all of the mitochondria from the father are located, they break away and they do not enter the egg. So the, the sperm only contributes the DNA from the autosomes and the sex chromosome, but it does not contribute to the mitochondrial DNA. It's not entirely true because like in one in 10,000 cases, one of these, the, the, the one of the mitochondria or two of the mitochondria from the sperm actually are incorporated into the egg. So there is some mitochondrial inheritance, like one in 10,000 um, births, um, a child will be born that have, has a mix of, of mitochondria from the mother and mitochondria from the father. Um, but remember, mitochondrial DNA generally is only inherited via the mother. Um, the, the mitochondrial DNA is of bacterial origin, which means that it uses not this um, intron exon structure, but it uses this, um, this monocystronic um, messenger RNA, so the whole thing is transcribed more or less in one loop. And again, has, since it is from bacteria, the whole machinery to to transcribe the mitochondrial DNA attaches to the, the circle, to the, to the little circle of DNA, and it just goes round and round to transcribe all of the genes which are located there. Um, the goal of mitochondria is to produce ATP, so energy for the cell, and in total there are 37 genes encoded on the mitochondria if you look at humans. So things like uh, cytochrome B, um, certain subunits which are used in the production of ATP, um, but also the own, uh, the mitochondria come with their own ribosome. 
So the ribosome which makes the proteins within the mitochondria is different from the ribosome which is in the cell which translates the autosomal genes into proteins. Um, and this is, and so in this part, 16S and 12S are, um, ribosomal RNA, um, this is uh, why we know that the mitochondria come from a bacteria. So um, originally mitochondria were free living bacteria, they got absorbed by a, by a cell and then they collaborated instead of um, being more or less destroyed within the cell. So inherited from the mother, How are you going? I'm I'm going well, doing well. Like almost done with the lecture. We need a couple more slides and uh, a couple more slides, um, and then we're done for today. So, um, and mitochondrial is one of these other types of DNA which is really really um, important in in multicellular organisms hey, because mitochondria produce the energy um, and you get them from your mother and only one in 10,000 people have um, mitochondria which come from the father. Another type of DNA only found in plants is the chloroplast and hey, because plants they do photosynthesis so they are multicellular organisms but they <coughs> Let me get a sip of I'm sorry, I don't have any water around, so I just have to rough through it. Do I know Guern? No, I don't know Guern. So chloroplast DNA um, is DNA which is only found in plants and algae and only plants which do photosynthesis and um, the chloroplast is uh, responsible for coding the whole photosynthesis system. So uh, they again come with their own RNA polymerase, um, they have their own tRNA, so their own ribosomal structure and these structures within the cell um, they are responsible for photosynthesis. So it is kind of the mitochondria of the plant. So that's kind of how I always describe the chloroplast. Um, they have a cyanobacterial ancestor, um, which is not that much of interest, but hey, if, you, if you're interested in like how did plants acquire the ability to do photosynthesis, well, they got that be because they kind of captured uh, cyanobacteria and then the cyanobacteria was kind of in the course of evolution adapted so that had this part of the of the plant cell um, can do photosynthesis. Um, it encodes between 60 to 100 genes um, and it has also it also has their own ribosome and and all of the things needed so photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 are encoded on there. All right that was it so we're through. Um, I told you today uh, about the uh, different history, um, so the history of DNA sequencing, the history of, uh, of, of kind of what we know about DNA, so how DNA was invented, how we know that it's a double helix. Um, I told you about DNA sequencing and the alignment of DNA sequences, um, and so um, I, I talked a little bit about the fact that hey you start off by trimming the reeds then you align the reeds um, not only you do you align the reeds but hey, after aligning the reeds you have to realign them because there are certain structures which are common commonly found in humans and since we only use a single reference genome we have to be sure um, that the um, reference genome is um, um, that, 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 that things which occur more often uh, relative to the reference genome are not making it so that reads are penalized for that. Hey, if you have a single nucleotide polymorphism, hey, then the read is still perfectly valid and it st still maps 100% there. Um, besides that, we talked about genes, things like gene structure, um, what is different between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Um, we talked a little bit about transposons and other regulatory elements, although we did that relatively quick. And I don't want you guys to know all of the different regulatory elements. I just want you guys to know that hey, if you have a gene, then in front of the gene, there are things which regulate this expression of the gene. They can be classified into the kind of the core region. Hey, and then we have the proximal region. And besides that, we also have transregulation, so regulation which could occur from other chromosomes. And besides that, we have uh, other types of DNA like mitochondria and uh, chloroplast and so the mitochondria are 
uh, generally called mtDNA, um, which you get from your mother, and chloroplasts are more or less the mitochondria that plants use to do photosynthesis and um, make sure that they get energy as well. All right, so for the six people who stayed till the end, thank you, thank you very much. Um, are, are there any questions? Um, the homework for today is a little bit of R, um, and it's not on Moodle yet. Um, I will put it on Moodle directly for you guys. Um, I'll actually do that a little bit later if you guys don't mind. Um, Misha, you have a question? Sure, shoot. It's going to be a long question. Like typing, 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 typing. Do cloned plants have jumping genes too? Yes, every living organism has jumping genes. Um, they are common in plants. They are less common in humans, but even humans have jumping genes. And the jumping genes in humans only become active just after fertilization. So when the sperm cell uh, um, of your father merges with the egg cell of your mother, um, at that point the, the whole epigenome is wiped. So at that point the cell doesn't have the control over the, uh, over the transposons. So they, they start jumping around. Um, but, but every living organism perhaps besides some bacteria, because bacteria have a very small genome and they try to get rid of everything that's not useful, um, but almost all more or less higher order living animals or, or, or cells like yeast, uh, they all have jumping genes and you can't get rid of the jumping genes. Um, but that because as a plant it is very important to... Uh, so cloned plants don't have to be genetically identical. They will not be genetically identical because there is always things like random mutations because like hey if you are a plant or if you have two cloned plants that are standing next to each other one of them might get a little bit UV light which changes a couple of base pairs in the DNA um, but cloned plants are definitely not genetically identical because of the transposons that are jumping around and causing uh, variation um, but of course like 99.999% of the genome will be equal and the chances of a transposon jumping into a major gene and, and disrupting it are also relatively small but it can happen it can happen that for example the FTO locus which is involved in flowering time um, is disrupted by a transposon making that two cloned plants can have different flowering times there goes months of macrophyte cloning why why because like in the end like the the idea of of cloning and and making things genetically identical is is that you have uh that you that you can exploit that right that you can predict when a plant will start to flower um but in in the end like life will do anything to prevent being completely locked into a certain genomic uh constitution Right, because in the end, if you if you are a hundred percent a clone of something, then that is very bad because that means that all of the clones are susceptible to, for example, a single virus, and it can wipe out the whole population. So life will always do anything it can um, and use any method possible to get like variants. And variation is very important for life to continue because hey, you need variation. They are identical. That's that's it's the same with inbred mice. Mice which are inbred are ninety nine point nine nine percent identical, but they are not a hundred percent identical. And one of the main um, ways that you can see that is, for example, the sex chromosomes, right? Um, inbred mice still come in a male and in a female form. That means that that they are not genetically identical because the, the female mouse has two X chromosomes while the main mouse has one X chromosome and one I cro Y chromosome. Gotta go, thanks for class, bye. Yeah, thanks for being here, Xanaxin. Thanks for staying until the end and um, answering the questions and just participating. Thank you for being here. So, um, yeah, but yeah, if you clone them, right, um, and the, the same thing holds for cloning plants or, or cloning other things, um, they are for 
research purposes, you assume that they are identical. The same with inbred mice, um, you assume that they are identical. You got inbred gerrits if you want some. Oh, that would be nice. That would be nice. Like, um, we're, we're almost cycled with the thing, tank, I think. Um, so there, it's almost like in harmony or in uh, homeostasis, how do you want to call it? Um, so it, it's time for some new um, some snails in the, in, in, in the aquarium as well. Good, if there's no other questions, then I will stop the recording. So people on YouTube, um, see you later. See you in the, um, see you next week probably, or in a couple of days. I don't know exactly the schedule for YouTube, so I have to look at that. At least um, see you next time, and I hope you enjoyed the lecture. If you enjoyed the lecture, give it a like and subscribe and all of these things. Um, of course, on Twitch as well. Good, see you next time.